Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Um, and again, welcome to today's panel presentation discussing the one book, one San Diego 2020 selection, They Called Us Enemy by George, George Takei. I'm Monica Chapa Domark, Principal Librarian of the Oceanside Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the library. Uh, they Called Us Enemy by George Takei is a graphic novel memoir that tells the story of Takei and his family's forced incarceration and internment camps during World War II. The Oceanside Public Library is pleased to host this program today. We are one of 80 public libraries, service organizations, and educational institutions who work in partnership with KPBS to bring One Book, One San Diego programming to the public. The One Book, One San Diego program encourages discussions of ideas or themes raised in featured books and examination of how those ideas or themes connect with our lives and communities. We've asked the Japanese American Historical Society of San Diego to help us do that today. It's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator. Linda Canada is a historian of local history who was the archivist for the Japanese American Historical Society of San Diego and who served as its president. She still handles its community outreach events and coordinates panels and talks like this one. So please welcome Linda Canada. All right, thank you, Monica, and welcome everybody. We're happy you're here to join us on the panel. Our purpose today is to extend your understanding of the materials in George Takei's book and to learn how they apply to the experiences of other Japanese Americans, specifically in San Diego and Imperial counties. Our panelists are Jack Kubota, who at age 13 was removed with his family from El Centro in Imperial County, and Kay Ochi, who was born after her family left the camp at Poston, Arizona, which is, by the way, shown in the photo that you see on your screen. Uh, and Kay has served as a civil rights advocate for Japanese Americans for close to four decades now. If you have questions, would you please put them in the chat at the bottom of your screen and then we will take questions at the end. So let me give you a little talk about the history of Japanese Americans in the counties we're talking about. Um, the 1880s were the start of immigration from Japan to Southern California and eventually the Southern California population in specifically San Diego, reached about uh, 2,000 people. Over in Imperial County, the total reached 1,300 people. Their work was in farming, um, Japanese-oriented businesses like groceries, cafes, hotels, bookstores, and in fishing along the coast. The first generation of this group were called Issei, and they came from Japan, and they spoke Japanese. Often their wives didn't learn English at all, and the wives worked with the men in whatever was the family business, raising the children and keeping house in whatever spare time they had. These children, the second generation, were known as the Nisei. They were the ones who were born in the United States and thus were American citizens. George Takei and most of the leaders in the Japanese American community after the war were Nisei. Nisei children went to school and church, became Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, and spoke fluent English. A few were also able to learn Japanese. There were Japanese language schools for kids after their normal schooling or on weekends, but sometimes the kids didn't really take it very seriously. In San Diego, like across the United States, there was discrimination and distrust of Japanese even before the attack on Pearl Harbor. They looked different, sounded different, ate different things, and tended to live in groups separating themselves from the English-speaking world. Japanese families, for example, lived in fish camps located near the tuna canneries, in farm labor camps like in Oceanside near the main gate at Camp Pendleton, and Japanese single men were in boarding houses run and occupied by Japanese in Escondido and Oceanside. The attack on Pearl Harbor inflamed the suspicions and concern about spies and espionage, especially on the Japanese fishing boats sailing offshore and in San Diego Bay, and among farmers and storekeepers and business people who simply received mail from families in Japan. President FDR put control of the Japanese in America 
in the hands of the army, which immediately looked at the coastal areas and created zones and ranked them in order of importance to the US military. Thus, some of the earliest to be removed were near major bays and military installations, and San Diegans were among the first to go. They were sent by train to the Santa Anita racetrack, just like Takei's family. This was a holding facility until the permanent camps were completed. Where they went after Santa Anita depended upon where Japanese American laborers were needed. The Roar Camp laborers drained the piney swamps at Arkansas and po uh, post and laborers helped create a canal to bring Colorado River water to the Indian reservations located along the river. Panelist Jack Kubota will talk a little bit about his family life in El Cajon, pardon me, El Centro before the war and his father who he called a samurai or warrior type. He will tell about their arrival at the Poston camp and his early departure. When Japanese Americans could return to the California coast in December 1945, both of our panelists' families did so. You'll learn how they restarted their lives after coming out of the camps with almost nothing. It took a long time for San Diego's Japanese American community to regroup. It wasn't until 1950 that the group's population was the same as 1940. Not everyone welcomed them with open arms, but persistence paid off. Nisei children went off to college and returned to San Diego to live, marry, and work. The next generation, the Sansei, were being born, and by the 1970s, these young men and women were becoming activists and speaking up for the civil rights and property lost by their parents and grandparents. Our panelist, Kay Ochi, born after her parents returned to Chula Vista from Poston, was one of these activists, and you'll learn about her work with national and local groups to help recover some of what the Japanese lost. By comparing and contrasting what happened in our local community with what happened to the Takei family, we hope you will learn that the experience of being imprisoned, in spite of being American citizens, affected generations of individuals and families in the Japanese American community. May we avoid repeating the mistakes of the past. Now, just a reminder, if you have a question, please put it in chat. And we're gonna do a little housekeeping here. We're gonna start our, our uh, interviews with Jack Kubota first. So Kay Ochi's gonna leave us for a minute here and we'll call her back when it's time to do her interview. So Jack, I've said that you, uh, you moved to Imperial Valley as an infant. What did your family do there and where did you live? Good morning to everyone. Uh, well, yes, our family uh, moved from Pasadena, California to uh, El Central to Imperial Valley because my father had already established a trucking business. And the uh, focus of that uh, activity was hauling uh, fresh produce from the Imperial Valley uh, uh, Japanese immigrant farmers to the Los Angeles wholesale uh, uh, fruits and vegetable market. Did you go to school with other Japanese in El Centro? Uh, actually, and because we lived in the town, uh, and the high school, the uh, grammar schools and the high school, I'm sorry, the grammar schools uh, where we went to had very few uh, Japanese American students. Uh, of course, then when he got to the high school level, then um, the Japanese American uh, students, uh, the Nisei, uh, th th that were bused from the farm farmland around the, the El Centro, they were all bused to the Central High School. And so then at, that, at, at the high school, all of the uh, students of Japanese ancestry were integrated with uh, all of the other citizens. Tell me about how did you hear about what happened at Pearl Harbor? Uh, Pearl Harbor came about, uh, there was a, you know, uh, phone messages from my father's the colleagues who were part of the Japanese Association in Imperial Valley. And uh, the word got around very quickly that the FBI was rounding up all of the uh, people who served in, uh, 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 you know, uh, official capacities, you know, as, as as board members and, and the like in, in the Imperial Valley. And so uh, 
In fact, uh, I recall very clearly how my mother packed a suitcase for my dad and it, it included all of her long, his long johns because I guess the word went out that possibly they would be shipped to some cold location. Was there something else that got packed later on when your family moved away that's special in your family's memory? Well, yes, as far as when we left El Centro, um, you know, um, the, the instructions were you got one, one piece of uh, luggage per person. And so then uh, in, in our family, my mother was, was insistent that she had to take her sewing machine with her because she didn't know, you know, we, don't know, we didn't know where we were going and oh, frankly, I'm sure why we were going as far as a kid. And so and my dad made a special, um, uh, you know, a shipping crate. And then uh, when the army uh, truck came to pick us all up at our home, you know, um, they know that, well, this is not a suitcase, but uh, my dad, uh, you know, shouted at the soldiers and I guess he bullied them into loading it into the truck. And then so when then when we went to the Buddhist church in El Central, where that was the assembly point for all the folks that leaving that day from the valley, uh, again, you know, the, the, the big shipping container with mom's uh, sewing machine was, you know, was laid out there. And uh, again, uh, the soldiers there said, well, that's not, uh, that's not baggage. And then uh, my son was able to, uh, to yell at the young men who were loading it. And uh, they were the Nisei uh, men of the uh, children of my dad's uh, clients, the farmers. And so they loaded that. And so the long and the short of it is, you know, we left town with the family and the sewing machine. And then uh, ultimately when my mom and dad came back to California, they settled in San Diego and, uh, you know, my, they came back to San Diego with um, the two of them, because all the children by then we had all scattered, but uh, she came back with uh, my mom, my dad, the sewing machine, and my, my older sister's ashes. Uh, she was, uh, she, she passed away in the camp two days after we got there. She was the second internee to die in the camp from lack of medical attention. Tell us about arriving at the camp from uh, after you left uh, the Imperial Valley, the Buddhist temple. What was that like to get to Poston? Well, you know, we, we, we left uh, El Centro about nine in the morning and these little old leaves of buses that were kind of like the school bus or something like that. They were not nice. They weren't nice Greyhound buses. And so we, we drove, I think, about 250 miles across the desert of Imperial Valley, across the Riverside County, and, and uh, you know, up through Desert Center, and they ended up in Poston on the east bank of the Colorado River. And this was in late May, and the temperature was something in the zone of 100 and 110, probably, maybe 5, 10, somewhere, something in that range. In any event, uh, we got there about 4 in the afternoon, and there was these barracks, and, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the, um, we had to, uh, we got beds like army cots and then uh, they had uh, big white sacks for us and we had to stuff them with the straw, bales, straw. They were bales of straw along the road in front of the barracks. And so that was our uh, Poston Hilton uh, adventure. Okay, did you go to school at Poston? Uh, yes, I, I, was, uh, I went to school for two years, my freshman and sophomore year of high school. And how was that? Well, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, as far as myself is concerned, it was a mini disaster and only because of uh, the uh, mediocrity of the, uh, of the staff, uh, the delinquencies, the absenteeism. Uh, it, 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 was, it, was not, it was not a very, uh, uh, you know, good place to have an education, no, indeed. Okay. And, and what did your family do about that? Well, a after a couple of years there, you know, they saw, they saw me going down the toilet, I guess, as a delinquent and, uh, you know, totally my grades were, you know, practically bad, zippo. And so uh, they arranged for me to leave the camp and join an older brother and uh, two older sisters that, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, two older sisters who had, had relocated to Colorado Springs, Colorado. 
Okay. Um, what did your mom and dad do in while they were at the camp? Did they have jobs? Oh, uh, yes. Uh-huh. Um, my dad was a cook in the mess hall, and my mother was a waitress in the mess hall. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So um, you set off for Colorado Springs by yourself? Yes. On a bus? Uh-huh. Okay. Right. Tell me, be before you left the camp, okay, but there's a lot of discussion by George Takei about very deep conversations that he had with his father about what was happening to them, about its justification or not. Did you and your father have any of those discussions? No, 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 no. My, my dad, you know, my dad was a very, very, as far as relationships with the children, uh, uh, virtually, you know, uh, he, do, he used to have raging debates with my older sister, who was, uh, in fact, when she was going to college, you know, already talking about the political atmosphere of America and bigotry and things like that. But never, never with the, not that I know of, with my, my brother or myself, um, my, oh, my immediate older sister, she worked for my dad as a bookkeeper. So, you know, she was very, very disciplined and... Uh, and she, you know, she was very bright and took care, took care of all the business part of my dad's trucking business. Okay. Okay. Did your family ever return to Imperial County after the war? Oh, well, no, ma'am. No. Zip. Where'd they go? Well, at first they went to Stillwater, Oklahoma, where my oldest sister had gotten a job working. I'm sorry, ma'am. I don't know what that is. Okay. Anyway, so... My oldest sister got a job as, as, as an instructor uh, of the Japanese language school of the United States Navy. And so with that job, she invited all of us to, to uh, go to Stillwater, Oklahoma. But uh, my mom and dad, and of course, my brother and I, uh, we couldn't handle it. And uh, so my brother and I left it after two weeks. But my mom and dad stayed, to, I think, by December of 45. And then they moved to San Diego. And what'd your dad do? He'd been a successful businessman before that, before the war. Well, so after he came back to San Diego, he started all over again as he did when he was an immigrant. He, he became a laborer and a, and a gardener. In fact, that was his pursuit the rest of his life. He got, you know, he had little hand tools that he had kept and you know, he took to camp with him. So he had a little bag with his lunch and he got on a bus and started doing gardening work for people who had you know, had their own equipment, you know, lawnmower and edgers and things like that. And, and then, what job was your mother able to get in San Diego? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, likewise, my mother, she just went back to what she did when she immigrated here. She went back to housekeeping. She'd get on the bus and in San Diego, she'd go and uh, go to the ferry and uh, go over to Coronado where, you know, a lot of the wealthy families and service people's families live. And that's where she started doing house cleaning. Okay, and tell me about you, you graduated high school in Colorado Springs. What happened after that with your education and, and work? Well, I, after I got out of, of high school, Colorado Springs, uh, I was 17, so I joined the Navy, and, uh, and I, I was aboard uh, a combat vessel for two years, did overseas duty in the Mediterranean Sea. And then uh, when I got out of the Navy, uh, I came back, at to California and to San Diego. And then I enrolled at San Diego State University. Uh, and uh, I stayed there one year. And then I transferred to University of California up in Berkeley, because that was the only institution, public institution, that had a full four year uh, curriculum for civil engin well, engineering, total engineering. And you're I still practicing today, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. I, 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 my daughter, who's watching, she's retired now, but the old dog, you know, I, I still put money in source. Okay. Um, Oops. Jack, one, um, one of the phrases that I have learned as I've been involved with this community um, is shikata ganai, uh, sort of loosely translated as it cannot be helped. How does that phrase relate to 
how your family felt about the US government and their incarceration? Did they talk about it? Were they unhappy? Well, you know, um, remember I told you, my dad and I weren't very much of conversationists, but, but my mother, uh, I, I thought she made, a, you know, a, you know, what I call a, a fairly clear picture of what that means. Uh, you know, we, we left El Centro, your children, her husband, and the sewing machine. And when she moved back to San Diego, uh, she came back with her husband and her sewing machine and my sister's ashes. Mm -hmm. And so through it all, and then she made the final commentary that, you know what? I lost a daughter, but my two sons were spared. I didn't have to be a gold mother. And so uh, I, I've, I've, try, I've tried to remember that, you know, that, okay, you, just, you have to get on with your life. You know? And okay. so keep your right. spirit and keep going. Thank you. And, and I'm going to ask you that one question we've talked about before. Um, just wrap up uh, your presentation. Tell me, do you think something like this could happen again today? The Japanese internment and today? Uh, you know, uh, I believe that we need a unity of an entire nation, red, white, and blue, uh, because if that, is, if that doesn't come about, then yes, it could happen again. Okay. Thank I, you. But I do have every every fiber of my body saying things are going to be okay. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much for your participation today. We're going to have you turn off your camera for now. And Kay, if you would come back online for me. So there's Kay. And there we go. Okay. So Jack, stay with us because you'll be coming back for the questions and answers. All right, well, Kay, your story is a little bit different and um, <laughs> you were born after the war. Um, do you wanna go briefly through your family and they have a long history in San Diego. Tell me about your parents and their language abilities, that sort of thing. Yes, I'm happy to. And I just wanna tell Jack that I was deeply moved by um, his family's story and um, to hear about his sister dying on the second day um, it was just, you know, mind blowing, but okay, about my parents, my mom and dad, Ichie and Akiji Ochi, were both born in San Diego, and um, as it happened, they were sent to Japan to be raised by relatives. They didn't return to the United States until they were teenagers, um, 15, 16 years old, and this would be in the mid-1930s, mid uh, so I'd say their formal education happened primarily in Japan and because their formative years were spent in Japan their language facility was well their primary language was always Japanese they were primarily our home was very uh, Japanese cultured and um, tradition traditional and they spoke to us in Japanese and they spoke to one another in Japanese and of course we spoke to them in English and um, that's kind of how it went. But uh, my dad became a houseboy. I don't think he was a very good student when he came back from Japan. He was a houseboy. My mom worked on a strawberry farm that some relatives owned in Solana Beach. And um, then in 1942, well, let, you know, the executive order 9066, um, everything changed for all Japanese Americans on the West Coast. And um, so they went to Post in Arizona with the rest of San Diego and with their respective families, of course. But by September of 42, my mom and dad got married. They experienced the war and camp um, at a particular age when, you know, courtship and starting a family was, you know, on their mind. And my older sister, Jane, was born in camp. And um, after the camps, of course, they came back to San Diego and we were very fortunate, you know, to live in such a beautiful place. My dad uh, became a fisherman out of San Diego Harbor. And my mom worked in the fish canneries for many, many decades. And um, we were able to, 
scraped together enough money to buy a small home in Chula Vista in the 50s. And I was raised in Chula Vista, went to all the public schools here, and ultimately ended up at California Western University in Point Loma for my um, undergraduate degree. Quickly went up to UCLA for my teaching credential, and um, the call of Los Angeles kept me. I not only had a wonderful teaching career there, but I met a wonderful uh, group of Japanese Americans in mostly the little Tokyo community. And it wasn't until approximately 2010 in my retirement that I came back to San Diego. And so here I am. Wow, nice long career. Tell me, when you were growing up, you were in middle school and high school in Chula Vista. Um, Did you learn anything about the internment years from your parents or maybe other Japanese Americans who you knew in the community? Not a thing. (laughs) Nothing. My parents, like Jack's parents, didn't, you know, really have discussions or dialogues with us. I think language was a primary issue. And um, certainly there was nothing in in our our books, school books, you know, at that time about the camps. I do believe, though, that my only connection with World War II was December 7th. Because every year when December 7th rolled around, I was, you know, a young girl, I dreaded going to school. It's like I knew there would be stairs and some taunts and just discomfort. And all the way through my high school, um, you know, my life, you know, December 7th was just a terrible, terrible day. And when I grew up, got much older, um, most of my Japanese American friends felt the same way. It's like the association with being the enemy just could never leave us because of December 7th and the constant reminders. Now, it's interesting how dates really trigger things for us. There's another date, and this is kind of off script for you, and I apologize. Um, So a date in February that comes up every year that Japanese Americans acknowledge. Would you talk about that? Yes. You know what I'm talking about? February 19, 1942, is when um, President Roosevelt signed the executive order that enabled the military to remove all the Japanese from the West Coast um, and other er some other areas also. But... Um, it really, President Roosevelt is, is really has a wonderful reputation as a very democratic president, but this would be a major blot on his history, on um, you know, his uh, presidency, and that is that he moved um, a particular racial group and put them in prisons, basically. We were imprisoned, incarcerated for on average three years, but every year on February 19th, um, many communities, many college students, universities, especially, you know, Nikkei student unions, we do have a day of remembrance. In Los Angeles, where I lived for all those years, we um, started having day of remembrances in 1979. And then uh, NCRR, the group with which I affiliated, started in 81. And actually, um, you know, I think we're coming up close to a 40th anniversary of Little Tokyo's in Los Angeles. Wow. And those are wonderful commemora- commemorations for what happened to uh, our parents, our grandparents, and to, you know, hopefully not just to remember, but also to relate it to what is going on in today's, t- today's world okay. and some of the injustices going on to other groups. You have been an activist for so long. Tell us about the specific group in which you were involved and how did you get involved? Um, Thank you. It's NCRR. The letters are much more convenient than the name. We were the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations. And what happened was in the summer of 1981, we're going back a long time, I got an invitation to attend something called a Federal Commission hearings. And this was in downtown Los Angeles at the Federal Building. And I had no idea what I was going to, but I know that the information was that um, a government panel would interview uh, Japanese Americans about what happened during World War II uh, and find out like the history of it and maybe make recommendations as to any remedy that could happen. And I thought, wow, this is very important. So I attended those hearings. I didn't know anyone else. I just went on my own um, and that day changed my life because in this auditorium with this auspicious panel at the front of the room, you know, men in suits, 
uh, judges, congressmen, um, that kind of thing. I saw a large gathering of Japanese Americans of all ages. And one by one, especially the Nisei, some Issei and some Sansei got up to the microphone and spoke. They talked just for three to five minutes on what happened to them and their families during camp. And sort of like Jack's story, they were breathtaking. It was um, so amazing to number one, see Japanese Americans speak so forthrightly. You saw tears from some of our elders and they don't cry, you know. Um, it was as if <clears throat> the opportunity opened the floodgates and um, there was no holding it back. And so the stories we, we heard that day changed my life. I think everyone in the room, it changed their lives, you know, um, and it got me started on the road to working on the redress campaign. I joined NCRR that very day. Um, it's been 40 years and we're an all volunteer organization. And we were really propelled by those testimonies. But I do want to add that that commission was so invaluable for creating our history, for being the stories kind of wove the fabric of what we had not known before. And um, the commission itself, that panel of, of men, as it were, uh, created a report in 1983 called, um, it was a book, Personal Justice Denied. It's a really valuable piece of work because it not only uh, put together that, the history of what they had learned and what the researchers had come up with, but their conclusion was so important. Um, they concluded that the wartime incarceration was based on wartime hysteria, race prejudice, and the failure of political leadership. And that statement just sort of uh, cemented our efforts for redress and reparations. We felt and tell me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to cut you short a little bit, but tell us what was the result? What was the redress and the reparation? Yes, well, um, the legislation on August 10th, 1988, then President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act. And that legislation that was finally passed in you know, 88, or 87 and 88, provided an apology, a governmental apology. And as it turned out, President George H.W. Bush signed the apology letter to my mom and dad. And President Clinton signed the apology letter to my, my sister, Jane, um, who was born in camp. And also um, the restitution, the token monetary restitution of $20,000 per person who was still alive on that day that the bill was signed. So you had to be alive on August 10th, 1988. If you died the day before, the month before, you know, you did not receive the restitution. Um, I do wanna add that many people asked for the apology letter if their parent had died before that date and the uh, Department of Justice did send that out. So that was very, very important. And um, towards, it took about 10 years for all the payments to be made uh, but ultimately over 82,000 payments and apologies were made. And uh, my mom and dad got theirs, in fact, because I worked with um, the Department of Justice, uh, the people there to make sure they got their checks. They sent me my mom and dad's check and I was able to drive it down to San Diego and hand it to them and have our own little dinner party. <laughs> it was really, really wonderful. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. wonderful. So I'll ask you the same question that I ended Jack's presentation with. Um, do you think something like this could happen again? Well, um, I do. I certainly do. And you see examples of it happening. You would hope that in the 21st century, as a people, as humanity, we would have evolved and not treated others as horribly as we do. Um, I'm, you know, I'm speaking of the immigrants, I'm speaking of, well, asylum seekers. And I think we all know that seeking asylum is, you know, a right afforded to all of the world's people. And, um, you know, things like that are heartbreaking because I think humanity, our humanity could be extended much further. Mm -hmm. I would hope that um, today that, you know, our story of Japanese Americans and what they went through 
people really remember the suffering of it. It wasn't just an isolated event. I think, you know, to be reminded of Jack's sister, of all the families that were torn apart, all the people who suffered, um, the losses, the terrible losses in their life. I think that it was a, a historic event and that um, those lessons should be remembered today and not repeated, of course. And I Which think- Which explains, a, yeah. And that kind of explains Jack, that, uh, that explains Jack's view. It explains why George Takei went ahead and wrote this book and explained his history and his activism history. And you've seen, um, uh, viewers, you have seen uh, examples of both of those in our local San Diego community. And I, I dare to say that for as many people as are still living who went through the experience or became activists after, there's many, many stories. Everybody's story is different. So if I don't encourage you to do anything more, I would encourage you to read, talk to people, learn more about what happened and why. So Jack, would you bring yourself back into the meeting by clicking on that camera icon? And um, we're gonna go start to go through questions or comments that have come in on the chat. There you are. Okay, so we have 14 uh, questions on the chat. And I'm just gonna go ahead and pull them up. And there's a lot of people talking about how they were hearing us fine. Um, so Bill Teague, um, a leader in our community at the Buddhist temple has a question. He says, many thanks to both panelists. And in reading the memoir, did any particular passage or incident speak to you? Jack, anything that comes to mind that was particularly? Uh, yes, I um, I noted. Um, I personally had had not knowledge of um, the severity of the uh, the uh, camp at Tule Lake because mm -hmm. that was virtually, according to uh, Mr. Takei, a virtual concentration camp. And, the, and then, of course, the, the revolt there within the camp itself, and then um, the, you know, the, mil the military really had, you know, putting, you know, having to ex exert its full discipline. Yeah. That, that surprised me. I just had no idea, no idea. Okay. Kay, anything come to mind for you? Um, well, that I enjoyed the book so much that it was a graphic novel, I think was genius because it opens an opportunity for children, younger people to read this book and learn all that George shared. Um, in fact, I already, when I purchased the book and read it, I loaned it to two of my grandnieces and, um, well, grandnieces who are 14 and 11. So they both read the book quickly. And I, I think it was because it was a graphic novel. So number one, kudos to George. But also I want to compliment him because I had forgotten that he had testified at the 1981 commission hearings. So, you know, I thank him for that also. Yeah. Also, uh, if I may, the fact that he recited the, the, his, his mom's sewing machine going to camp, and I thought that, that happened in our family with my mom. I thought that, gee, that's, that's not, that is not just a coincidence. And you, you know, as the former historian and archivist for the Japanese American Historical Society here, I've collected a lot of information and helped to get people to donate things from the camp years. And we actually have a sewing machine in our collection that went to camp. And in the case of this particular sewing machine, it was modified from being a pedal type operated sewing machine um, a local electrician, a Caucasian man, before the family went off to camp, modified it so that it could be operated electrically. So that mother was able to have her sewing machine in camp as well. As part of my role as the archivist, I've collected lots of stories over the years, and I, and I do want you to know that, you know, I have lists of people in our own community who went not just to the Tule Lake camp, but also who were in that prison camp at Tule Lake. And we have people in our community who were part of the groups that were repatriated to Japan. A couple of different families had that happen. Um, and, and one of them um, 
you know, was a, a teenage, maybe end of her teenage years, young woman um, who, you know, went to work uh, at one of the military bases and interacted with the occupation soldiers uh, in Japan after her family had been sent back. Um, another family was on their way over to Japan and apparently the the father and the family passed away before they got there. So they arrived in Japan, um, you know, as people from America who had no strong father influence to help them get housing and food in a country that was decimated um, and had neither of those things to offer young families. So many, many stories. So um, again, I encourage you, we have a wonderful archive of material which you can visit and, and learn more about our local community. For those of you who, have, who are listening but who have not yet read the book, um, you should know that because of the One Book, One San Diego program and because of the actions of local libraries like the Oceanside Public Library, there are online editions of this graphic novel that you um, are able to access as well. So I would encourage you um, to, to take uh, a look at that. And um, I have another quest, couple other questions who've come up here. Um, oh, very good question from Andrea. How did your families answer the two big questions? And we didn't talk about those two big questions. Kay, do you have a succinct way of describing those questions first? Right, questions 27 and 28, the loyalty questions. So um, I believe it was in 1943, the government um, needed to be able to recruit more soldiers for the war. And um, you know, in the camps, you had a lot of young men. And I think one of the ways of, of sifting <laughs> through was the loyalty question. Um, and so 27, question 27, and I'm not sure if the order will, was, you know, uh, would you be willing to serve in the military of the United States and for their allegiance to the emperor of Japan? You know, those were sort of the questions. And um, so many, many people said yes and yes, but there were many also who said no and no, because I don't have allegiance to Japan anyway. So, you know, it's like you're setting me up and um, I won't to the military unless you let my parents and my family return home and it, you know be outside of these prison uh, walls. And so there were many reasons people said no, no, but they were the ones that we referenced earlier that were sent to Tule Lake and um, you know the no-no boys, as it were. Yes. And um, just an aside, that how you answered those questions uh, kind of sealed your fate because if you said no, no, there was a, a pall cast upon you for perhaps the rest of your life. In our own Japanese community, it's rather heartbreaking. There was a lot of tension and even a schism between those who were thought loyal by saying yes, yes, and those who were thought disloyal by saying no, no. And nothing could be further from the truth. I think the government put people in this horrible situation um, and the impact of that incarceration has lasted for many generations. It's terrible. Jack, did you have any experience with the, the questions 26 and 27 or no, no, yes, yes answers? No, during my time in the camp and any discussions that, that was never an issue with, in our family. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from Sergio who wants to know, uh, thanks you both, um, and wants to know about Japanese Mexicans who lived in Tijuana and Ensenada, and, and do either of you have any experience with what might have happened to them? Um, and, and Kay, this would be your opportunity, I think, also to speak about Peruvians. Mm -hmm. um, Jack, did you know any Japanese Mexicans who went to camp? Uh, yes, there was a, a family in the next barracks from us. Oh, and, wow. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, because of the uh, attitudes of some uh, Japanese about people, uh, you know, of, uh, of different ethnicities being married couples, uh, my mother was a very, very kind person, and she helped out that family. It was a young family with infants and uh, uh, young children, and so uh, yeah, my mom helped the family regularly, 
and although they were, you know, kind of, you know, um, uh, you know, discriminated against by other people in the camp. Mm -hmm. Wow, I did not know that, but that's so mm -hmm. interesting. Um, I, I think Linda has offered me the opportunity to talk about Japanese Latin Americans and um, what I learned, not only at the commission hearings in 81, but throughout the redress campaign, was that the United States government orchestrated a kidnapping of uh, Japanese from Peru and other uh, Latin American countries to be brought up to the United States, imprisoned beside Japanese Americans. They went primarily to Crystal City, Texas, but ultimately to be used as prisoner of war exchange. And um, the Peruvian government from where most of the Japanese uh, came, you know, worked in concert with the US government to do that. And um, I worked, <laughs> the irony is that they were here thrown into these camps for upwards two, three, four years, but actually Crystal City did not even close until I believe 1947, because these people had nowhere to go. Peru did not want them back. The United States didn't really want them. And they were basically, you know, like homeless. And um, so unfortunately the Civil Liberties Act excluded them in receiving reparations because you had to have been a U.S. citizen to, or a permanent resident to receive the reparations. That was one of the rules. And these people were not. And so um, the story gets worse. After much lobbying with um, the Department of Justice during the 1990s to win reparations for the Japanese Latin Americans, upwards of almost 2,300 were brought to the United States. Um, that the courts, we even took it to Court of Appeals and they were denied, continually denied redress. And um, un unfortunately, when Mr. Uh, President Clinton was in office, he had um, different people who supported somewhat, uh, you know, that some reparations be made. And the, la the final story was that a settlement was made with Japanese Latin Americans to receive $5,000 and an apology. And I wrote for the most recent issue of Footprints, the newsletter of the Japanese American Historical Society, an article about a friend, Arturo Shibayama, um, who was one of the Japanese Latin Americans, who turned down the $5,000 and said it's, you know, added insult to injury. I said, I think I deserve the same compensation that Japanese Americans received. And um, he didn't get that. So I think that um, he took it to the world court and just a few months ago, the world court ruled in his favor. Unfortunately, my friend Art passed away two years ago and didn't mm -hmm. live to hear this wonderful verdict. It was a victory in principle, certainly. And I just wish he had lived to hear it because he suffered tremendously. Thank you, Kay, I appreciate that. Um, in our own community, there is a woman who is at the Buddhist temple who was living in Mexico um, at the, the time of Pearl Harbor. And apparently, the, Mexico as a country took the position that they weren't going to start any camps. They were simply going to evacuate people who were perceived to be threats, fishermen and farmers who were living near the coastal areas, that they wanted to, they would force them to either uh, Mexico City or Guadalajara um, no compensation, no housing, they just had to go. Um, so this young woman who was a, a Buddhist when she went, when she left uh, Mexico, the coastal Mexico went to Mexico City where there was no Buddhist temple. Um, so she became a Catholic uh, and that's where she spent her wartime years. So yeah. Um, so uh, another question, did either of you remember having any outside visitors or Kay hearing about any outside visitors who visited the camp. Jack, anything in your memory? Oh yes, uh, my dad had a uh, friend, uh, started out as a business person and they became very close friends in El Centro, his name is Mr. Robert Hatton. And uh, he came to the camp with care packages and, uh, and, and stayed in close contact with our family. In fact, then and after the war, when my mom and dad relocated to San Diego, my dad would go down and visit Mr. Hatton in El Centro regularly, regularly. And if wow. you 
And when you go deep sea fishing and catch some fresh fish, he'd take it down to Mr. Hatton. Probably one of the most um, famous, uh, I use that word guardedly, she was certainly very well known in San Diego, was the librarian Clara Breed, who uh, knew many of the Japanese American children when they were coming to the San Diego Public Library children's room to check out books and just to chat. Uh, Clara Breed went to the train station in San Diego the day that they were in April 8th, when, 1942, when they were asked to leave. She handed out self-addressed stamp postcards, invited the children to correspond with her. And she actually did make um, uh, at least one trip to Poston. And in our collection at the, San, at the Japanese American Historical Society, we have her permission slip, her timed permission slip for for visiting that camp. So it, there are several publications um, about Miss Breed's story. The one that's close to our heart here in San Diego was written by a woman named Joanne Oppenheim and it is titled Dear Miss Breed. And I highly recommend it to you. Um, there was a question at the end because we are coming toward our end. We do wanna let you know that we're recording and I see that Monica answered this as well. Um, Eleanor wanted to know how many people lived in a building, a barracks, and what kind of privacy did you have from other families? Jack, this is really kind of yours. Do you remember how big the barracks was and uh, was there privacy? Well, the barracks, I believe, were 100 feet long and 25 feet wide, and they were divided into four 25 by 25 cubicles. And so, yes, in, in that context, yes. Mm -hmm. So, but it, in, in the 25 by 25, it was my brother and I and my uh, immediate older sister, my mom and dad. So the six of us were in a room 25 by 25. Could you hear the other people in the other barracks? Oh, the other room? Uh, yeah, yeah, next next door? Oh, are you kidding? <laughs> just a, you know, just a wooden wall, yeah, I mean, you know, cracks in the floor, you know, and tar paper on the side and tar paper on the roof. Um, yeah, but wood and tar paper on top. Oh yeah, they, they, they were humble surroundings, I'll say that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, start again. What shocked me about lack of privacy were the bathrooms. They were communal bathrooms, you know, one big long barrack, but um, with toilets, set with no partitions, showers set with no partitions. And um, just thinking about that, you know, as a young woman or a grown woman, you know, just how um, dehumanizing, dehumanizing that would be. was indicative of the overall treatment towards Japanese, I feel. Okay, we're having some trouble with your audio, so you're breaking up a little bit. So. Okay. Okay, yeah. Basically, Kay was talking about how dehumanizing it was, and one wonders about the intent. You know, was this an intentional thing? The government uh, said, oh, well, we didn't have all the things we needed right away, and we needed to get them in there. And Some of these things were fixed later. In the later years, apparently, there were partitions between the individual toilets in either the men's or the women's latrines, as they were we called them. Here in California, if you go up to San Jose, there is a wonderful historical society, Japanese American group up there, which actually um, has replicated a, uh, the latrine as well as a barracks to give people a sense of, uh, of, of what it was really like to live in this environment. Um, well I could just add to that, you know, these bear, this entire, these encampments were all patterned after army, army camps, ar army training centers. And so, in fact, uh, uh, when I went aboard ships, our latrines aboard ship were just like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, you know, that, that, was, that was the emphasis, you know, I mean, just build them quickly and build them to whatever kind of plans you have. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'll say that you could play poker with all your buddies if you're sitting down. <laughs> All right. Well, Monica, we're getting toward the end of the uh, presentation. Would you like to close us out? Thank you, everybody, yes. for being part of our talk. Thank you. I have to thank Jack and Kay for being our panelists today. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for doing this and for doing it on Zoom, too. So I know that's 
always a challenge, but um, thank you so much. And thank you, Linda, for the work that you're doing with the Japanese American Historical Society of San Diego. We really appreciate you. And um, I just want to give an, a special thanks to the Friends of the Oceanside Public Library for their support of this program. And um, you'll all be receiving an email, our audience, um, and I will put my contact information on that email. And if you have any comments or questions, uh, we still do have uh, copies of the book for giveaway. So if you are interested in that, email me. And then um, as Linda mentioned, um, there is an electronic copy of the book on Hoopla available to um, Oceanside Public Library users. So mm. thank you. Thank you so much and have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.